Welcome to this video on the ABCDE assessment framework. We're going to go through the assessment and look at some of the common causes and management strategies. We hope you find it useful. So why do we use the ABCDE assessment framework? Well, it is the same assessment framework that all healthcare professionals are taught, so it provides consistency. It's systematic, it's quick, and it includes all of the body systems. It's easy to remember once you know it, and it's essential for recognising deteriorating and critically ill patients. The ABCDE assessment framework is also recommended by the Resuscitation Council UK. So some things to think about before you begin your assessment. You must ensure your own personal safety and the safety of your patient. You must also consider any personal protective equipment that you need to use, such as gloves, aprons and goggles, and make sure that your hands are decontaminated. It is also important to make sure you get informed consent from your patient. Good morning, Mr. Bater. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. What would you like me to call you today? Uh, Mike is fine. Thank okay. You. My name's Katie, and I'm the nurse that will be looking after you today. I'm just going to do an ABCDE assessment as part of my morning observations. Is that okay? That's fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You must recognise when help is required, and if your patient is unresponsive, you must perform a rapid look, listen, and feel assessment. If there are no signs of life, commence CPR as per protocol. The first part of the airway assessment is to look for airway patency as a look, listen and feel approach. So first of all, I'm looking for any signs of airway obstruction in the airway. I'm then listening for breath sounds and for the breath sounds I can hear, are there any noisy breath sounds or ad added breath sounds? I'm also looking and making sure there isn't any seesaw movement of the chest and the abdomen. As Mike is able to talk to me, I can see that his airway is patent. So let's think about some common causes of complete or partial airway obstruction. This could be due to altered consciousness of your patient due to a variety of reasons, which mean they cannot maintain their own airway and there may be upper airway collapse. It could be due to vomit in the airway or swelling due to anaphylaxis direct trauma to the face, or a foreign body that has got stuck in the airway, such as food or a tooth, for example. It could also be due to laryngospasm, which is when the vocal cords close and cause a partial or complete obstruction of the airway. Whilst this is rare, you may encounter this in the recovery unit post-anesthesia. Airway management will ultimately depend on the cause of the airway obstruction, but a simple technique to begin with is a head tilt, chin lift, or jaw thrust, which will move the tongue up and forward out of the airway. You can also use suction within the patient's mouth to remove any visible secretions or vomit. It is important to apply high flow oxygen via a non rebreather mask with any airway complication. If you are competent, a nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal airway could be considered and prepared for a senior member of the team. You must remember that an airway complication is a clinical emergency and you must not proceed with your assessment until this has been resolved. Call for help as soon as possible and if your patient continues to deteriorate they may require bag valve mask ventilation and tracheal intubation by the medical team. It is really important to remember to treat any life-threatening problems before you can move on with the rest of your assessment. As part of your breathing assessment, you must count the number of breaths over a full minute. I'm just going to loosen this mic, okay. okay? To ensure you get an accurate breathing assessment, you need to make sure that the chest is exposed. I'm just going to bring this down, okay? okay? Here I'm looking for the rate, rhythm and depth of breathing, making sure there isn't any shortness of breath or Mike isn't struggling to breathe at all, using any accessory muscles. Also making sure that there's bilateral movement of the chest, the rise and the fall. We're also checking for any chest deformities. It's also important to listen out for any extra breath sounds that you can hear, such as wheezing or secretions. We also need to make sure that the trachea is in alignment and there isn't any deviation. We also need to make sure that Mike can take a nice deep breath in on command and also a cough. Can you take a nice deep breath in for me? And out. And can you do a cough for me? 
As part of the breathing assessment, you should also check your patient's oxygen saturations. If you are competent in the use of the stethoscope, you can auscultate your patient's lungs. There are a number of tests that can be performed or requested depending on the cause of the breathing complication. These can then guide your management and help to rule out any possible other causes. The tests can include an arterial blood gas, collection of sputum, chest x-ray or spirometry tests. There are many possible causes of breathing complications and these can either be acute or chronic. One of the main causes can be due to a reduction in respiratory effort. Some examples of this include increased muscle weakness in conditions such as MS or Guillain-Barre syndrome. Direct trauma such as rib or sternum fractures will also impact on respiratory effort. Central nervous system depression caused for example by strong opioids such as morphine can cause reduced respiratory drive. Spinal damage may have a direct impact on respiratory effort and if your patient is in pain this will inhibit their ability to deep breathe and cough as required. Chest wall abnormalities such as kyphoscoliosis can also reduce respiratory effort. Specific lung disorders can also cause breathing complications such as a pneumothorax or hemothorax, an infection for example pneumonia, aspiration of food or stomach contents, exacerbation of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma, pulmonary embolus or pulmonary edema. As always, breathing management strategies will depend on the cause. It is important to apply high flow oxygen via a non-rebreather mask in all breathing complications to aid with adequate oxygenation. Titrate the oxygen to maintain saturations between 94 and 98 percent and in those patients with known hypoxic drive such as those with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease you must still apply and titrate oxygen to maintain saturations between 89 and 92 percent. You may need to position your patient to aid with lung inflation and respiratory effort such as sitting up or leaning forward as comfortable for your patient. Encourage your patient to deep breathe and cough as appropriate. Suction may be required to remove excess sputum and secretions. If breathing complications persist, your patient may require non-invasive ventilation, bag valve mask ventilation or intubation and invasive ventilation. The next part of the assessment framework is circulation. In this part, you must observe your patient's skin colour for any cyanosis, pallor or any sweating. You can also check the peripheries for the temperature. I'm just going to check your hands and arms here, Mike, OK? You can also do this on the feet and legs. You must then palpate your patient's pulse over a full minute, feeling for rhythm, rate, regularity and depth. Following on from the pulse measurement, you can take your patient's blood pressure. Mark, I just need to pop this cuff on your arm, okay? Mike, I'm just going to take your capillary refill time, okay? So I just need to hold your hand up here at heart level. I'm just going to press for five seconds and see return of circulation within two seconds. It is also important to consider fluid balance and urine output at this point. Tests that could be performed or requested in regards to circulation complications could include 3-lead cardiac monitoring, 12-lead ECG, invasive hemodynamic monitoring, for example arterial or central lines, and any relevant blood results. Circulation complications can be caused by primary heart disease or by heart abnormalities secondary to other problems. Some common causes include heart disease, heart abnormalities, myocardial ischemia, myocardial infarction, heart failure, hypovolemia, arrhythmias, cardiac tamponade and myocarditis. Some common management strategies for circulation complications include the following. 
Intravenous fluids should be administered to hypovolemic patients. There should be consideration of patient's position. For example, patients with acute cardiac ischemic pain may be more comfortable sat up. However, if there has been a reduction in cardiac output due to fluid loss, lying down may be more beneficial. Any electrolyte disturbances, for example potassium and magnesium, should be monitored and supplemented as required to maintain adequate cardiac function. Appropriate and specific medications could be considered such as GTN, inotropes and diuretics. The next part of the assessment framework is disability. At this point you can do a quick and rapid AFBU test. By observing Mike, I can see that he is alert. As part of the neuro assessment, I'm also going to be checking Mike's pupils for size and reaction to light. Mike, I'm just going to shine a bright light in your eyes, okay? Just look ahead for me. During pupil assessment, you should be looking for size, shape and reactivity to light on both eyes. There should be consensual reaction. It is also important at this point to check your patient's blood sugar. Mike, I just need to take a sample of blood from your, your finger, okay? okay? As part of the disability assessment, it's also important to check your patient's pain score. Mike, I'm just going to ask you about your pain, okay? If 10 was extreme pain and 0 was no pain at all, where would you be at the moment? I'm 0. Okay, so no pain. Thank you. You must also consider any other symptoms, such as nausea and vomiting. Mike, have you been experiencing any nausea at all? No. Have you had any episodes of vomiting? No, not at all. Okay. Some common causes of neurological complications include the following. Hypoxia, hypercapnia, cerebral hypoperfusion, sedative use, analgesic drugs, trauma, hypo or hyperglycemia, recreational drugs, and alcohol. Common management strategies for neurological complications include nursing unconscious patients laterally. You must ensure that their airway is protected. You must treat blood sugars if below 4 millimoles per litre as per trust protocol. You can also review the drug chart for any reversible causes. The next part of the assessment framework is exposure. Within this, it's important to maintain your patient's privacy, dignity and temperature control. The first thing I'm going to do is check Mike's temperature. Mike, I just need to take your temperature, okay? Have you got an ear that you'd rather? This one's fine. Okay. So I'm just going to pop this in. You must also check your patient's skin integrity. You should do this from head to toe and front and back. What I'm looking for here is any breaks in the skin, or rashes, or lumps, or bumps, or any wounds. Mike, I'm just going to ask you to roll on your side if that's okay, just so I can check your back. Okay. All right. Okay, lovely, thank you then. You must also make sure that you're monitoring your patient's bowel movements. Mike, when was the last time you had your bowels open? It was this morning. Okay, thank you. The next step is assessing the abdomen. To do this, first of all, you need to expose the abdomen. I'm just going to bring this down, Mike, okay? Okay. First of all, I'm just going to inspect the abdomen. And then you can auscultate in all four quadrants and listen out for bowel sounds. I'm just going to put this on, okay? You can also use this opportunity to inspect for any IV lines or infusions, drains or urinary catheter. Throughout the assessment framework, you should be able to prioritise and rationalise the use of any assessment tools. Some common assessment tools include AVPU and Glasgow Coma Scale for a neurological assessment. Pain scores will vary on which area you work, but may include a 0 to 3 or 0 to 10 score. Socrative's pain assessment tool may be used to assess cardiac pain. The Waterloo score is used to assess for skin integrity. The Visual Infusion Phlebitis score or VIP score can be used to assess any IV lines. The Bristol stool chart can be used to assess bowel habits. The Malnutrition Universal Screening Tool or MUST 
can be used to assess for dietary needs. Body mass index, or BMI, can be used to determine a patient's weight in regards to their height. To calculate any risk of falls, you can use Stratify or FRAT. All of your observations should be accurately recorded and a National Early Warning Score or New Score calculated. The appropriate guidance and management should then be sought depending on this score. We hope you found this video on the ABCDE assessment framework useful. Please utilise the references to find out more and to help consolidate your learning. Thank you.